Well, good evening, everybody. Can you hear me on Zoom? I see a couple of hands waving there. Happy Wednesday night. Nice to uh, see all of you folks. Um, even uh, Mr. D, who's dancing across the screen there. So that's really great. We've got our live class in front of us tonight. So welcome. Welcome to our live class. Yep, I had to take care of a few health issues myself the last couple of weeks. So that's why I did uh, a Zoom with everybody. So we're back to a live class here and we've got our Zoom folks here. So really glad to have you. Were you able to Zoom folks? Were you able to download the uh, outline for tonight? Hopefully, so I see some thumbs going up. Good. It, it, it just turned out to be a massive amount of uh, sacred scripture that we're going to cover tonight. So it just was a little bit more prudent uh, to print it. So I hope uh, you're able to print it off if you have the means or if you have two devices that you can have the outline on uh, a phone and, and your, your uh, Zoom on a tablet. I don't know how all that works. <laughs> so uh, tonight we're uh, studying the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. And it's a marvelous uh, study for us to look at the Holy Spirit. I mean, it, it, it's a massive study, of course, because it means that we need to uh, cover every verse of Holy Scripture. <laughs> I mean, he who breathed out the word of God, the Holy Spirit, right? He gave us every word of Scripture. So for us to study the Holy Spirit and the doctrine of him would be to, to read every verse of sacred Scripture and say, uh, now we've just cracked the surface of of who the Holy Spirit is and how he ministers and serves to us. So uh, tonight I'm going to uh, begin with a uh, devotional reading um, on the Holy Spirit. I've used this before. It's the, the book, The Valley of Vision. It's a collection of Puritan prayers and devotions. And this one was uh, particularly interesting uh, to me as we think uh, and put our minds and hearts together regarding the Holy Spirit. So join me in this uh, a prayer and meditation as we start. O God, the Holy Spirit, thou who dost proceed from the Father and the Son, have mercy on me. When thou didst first hover over chaos, order came to birth. Beauty robed the world. Fruitfulness sprang forth. Move, I pray thee, upon my disordered heart. Take away the infirmities of unruly desires and hateful lusts. Lift the mists and darkness of unbelief. Brighten my soul with the pure light of truth. Make it fragrant as the garden of paradise, rich with every goodly fruit, beautiful with heavenly grace, radiant with rays of divine light. Fulfill in me the glory of thy divine offices. Be my comforter, light, guide, and sanctifier. Take of the things of Christ and show them to my soul. Through thee may I daily learn more of his love, grace, compassion, faithfulness, and beauty. Lead me to the cross and show me his wounds the hateful nature of evil, and the power of Satan. May I there see my sins as the nails that transfixed him, the cords that bound him, the thorns that tore him, the sword that pierced him. Help me to find in his death the reality and the immensity of his love. Open for me the wondrous volumes of truth in his it is finished. Increase my faith in the clear knowledge of atonement achieved, expiation completed, satisfaction made, guilt done away, my debt paid, my sins forgiven, my person redeemed, my soul saved, hell vanquished, heaven opened, Eternity made mine. O Holy Spirit, deepen in me these saving lessons. Write them upon my heart that my walk be sin loathing, sin fleeing, and Christ loving, and suffer no devil's device to beguile or deceive me. So, Heavenly Father, we begin by asking for your blessing and the fullness of the Holy Spirit 
to dwell with each one of us. Open your precious word to us this night, O oh God. Teach us some of the great truths and mysteries of the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. And grant, Holy Spirit, that our faith might be kindled afresh and anew this night. In the name of Jesus, we ask this. Amen. Well, friends, glad to have you along uh, with us for tonight. The study, again, the work of the Holy Spirit. And I hope we can have lots of interaction on this. Uh, and, of course, uh, I'll, I'll need some input via chat from all our dear friends on Zoom. So uh, whoever's best at uh, chatting, I'm going to need some folks to send me some information uh, pretty shortly. Okay. So uh, let's just start, especially for our, our uh, live uh, class who's here, and I'll try to, you know, repeat and share things because I guess it just doesn't transmit through the microphone so much, right? When the live class is talking to me, it's not easy for you folks on Zoom to hear that is, is, is I guess, uh, the problem that we have that way. So I'll try to relate those kinds of things. But um, let's start, ask our friends here tonight, in what way... Are you most aware of the Holy Spirit in your life? So let's ask our live friends if, if they can uh, share with us. In what way are you most aware of the Holy Spirit in your life? We'll start us off. Okay. Uh, I, I think conviction. I, I think that's when I, when I feel convicted, I, I know it's the Holy Spirit. And I think most often, I hope to say it, but I think most often that's how I... Okay. Thanks. Yeah, the, the response was um, that I experienced the Holy Spirit most in conviction when he's reminding me of a personal sin I've committed, um, that he brings that to my awareness and attention. So, great. Go ahead. Reminding me of truth through scripture, just bringing things back to my mind. Okay. Excellent. So, the Holy Spirit who reminds me of truth that I've already previously learned or met. And he brings it back to my remembrance at, at various needed times. So that, that's an exciting way to be conscious of him. Go ahead. Well, when, I read it, when I just sit down and read the word, it just seems to illuminate it, makes it more real and alive. I mean, if you read it, and you, you know, this is the word of God speaking to me. And it just becomes something more precious, you know. As I'm reading it. Excellent. Excellent. So another response was just as I'm reading the word of God, the Holy Spirit makes it come alive. He illumines it. Uh, he brings, you know, great power and strength to the words that I'm reading. So conscious of the Holy Spirit that way. Anyone else yet? Go ahead, please. Uh, in prayer time and with the Lord and worship. Okay. In prayer and in worship that we're conscious and aware of the Holy Spirit. So I hope tonight, too, it's a blessing for all of us especially you dear folks on Zoom, that we're conscious of the Holy Spirit and his ministry, even to us tonight. It's a blessing to be gathered with our live friends and, of course, with our Zoom friends. And, and we're trusting that tonight is far more than just academia, right? This is engaging with the living God and on the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. Uh, I pray that it, it's a blessing for us tonight. So there's a fancy name, perhaps on your outline, that I left you. The study of the Holy Spirit is called pneumatology almost sounds like i don't know some like a disease, <laughs> yeah, like a disease or like um uh, you know you take care of your skin or you're taking care of something like that but uh, that's a greek word pneumatology the greek word pneuma is the greek word for spirit so that's the fancy name for the doctrine of the holy spirit we're going to do a quick uh, introductory uh, notes that you have on your outline. So uh, if we look at the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament, we're going to do just a really quick survey. I left you a Hebrew word there on your outline, which is ruach, R-U-A-C-H. Ruach is the word that would translate Holy Spirit for us in the Old Testament. It's found 378 times in the Old Testament. And in the Aramaic, the same word shows up 11 times in the book of Daniel. So the book of Daniel also mentions the spirit. This word ruach is translated, though, three different ways. And depending upon the context, it can mean one of these three definitions. First of all, the spirit, namely the Holy Spirit. This Hebrew word is also used to translate wind 
And today we had a wind chill outside, so it can be translated like that. And finally, breath, where God breathes out into Adam and Eve the breath of life. So the same Hebrew word can be translated Holy Spirit, breath, or wind 378 times in the Old Testament. And the context alone is going to determine if it meet which of those three it's going to mean. So the same word translated three different ways. Now, when we look at the 378 times that this Hebrew word ruach appears in the Old Testament, we find that only 79 of the 378 times it appears, it refers to the Holy Spirit. So this Hebrew word, 21% of the time in the Old Testament, refers to the Holy Spirit. The rest of the time, it'll be breath or wind, the physical wind of the universe, or sometimes, as we said, God's breath. The term is found immediately in sacred scripture at Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, and we find the term ruach all the way to the end of the Old Testament in Malachi chapter 2, verse 15. So the term is found from cover to cover in the Old Testament. The Holy Spirit, when ruach means Holy Spirit, appears most often, I guess I was a little surprised when I learned this tonight, 15 times in the book of Isaiah. So the prophet Isaiah, it has the most usages of the term ruach, meaning Holy Spirit. And then also the book Ezekiel, the term ruach appears there 15 times as well too. Now, when we jump to the New Testament, the word spirit, we'll take a survey of the word spirit, which is pneuma. You can see that I think on your notes, P-N-E-U-M-A. A, correct? Did I? Yeah, I left that for you there. This appears 379 times in the New Testament, one more time than in the Old Testament. Now, the Holy Spirit, when we look at the word pneuma, translated spirit, of the 379 times that it occurs, 245 of them relate are directly a reference to the Holy Spirit. So 65% of the usages of the word pneuma in the New Testament are directly the Holy Spirit. And the term pneuma, referring to the Holy Spirit, is found in 23 of the New Testament books, 23. The only books the term Holy Spirit does not appear in is Philemon, little uh, epistle there, James, and 2nd and 3rd John. So uh, those four books, the, the term Holy Spirit. But otherwise, the Holy Spirit, of course, is all over the New Testament books. Um, and we find the first reference to the Holy Spirit in Matthew chapter 1, verse 18, uh, that the angel says to Joseph, uh, you know, that uh, Mary will be with child through the Holy Spirit. There's our first reference there. And the last reference to Holy Spirit in Revelation 21 verse 17, that the spirit and the bride invite people to come to Jesus Christ. So uh, the, the span of the Holy Spirit, of course, is all throughout uh, the entire New Testament as well, too. The most appearances of the term pneuma, Holy Spirit, are in the book of, anybody want to guess? Most appearances of the term Holy Spirit. In the, uh, that actually is the second highest, uh, 1 Corinthians has 22 references to the Holy Spirit. Romans has 28. And the book with the highest uh, usages of Holy Spirit is the book of Acts because of Pentecost. I'm thinking of letters, but yeah, but yeah. yeah. So the book of Acts has 56 references to the Holy Spirit. Now, briefly here in introduction, we want to already deal with the fact, I don't think it's a question widely among us or our, our Zoom circles here, but how do we know the Holy Spirit is a person or being versus him being energy or a force? How do we know the Holy Spirit is a living being? Anybody care to? He's God, like the God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit is a person just like they are. Okay, so, so uh, we look first at the Trinity, and God the Father is a person or being, a living being. God the Son is and thus also we we would make that conclusion. Any other answers? How do we know he's a living being versus an aura 
or energy in the new age movement, huh? Go ahead. For me, it would be that many times he's spoken of as a person when he, the Holy Spirit, so he's spoken of as a personage. Yes. And other times where where the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit took Paul and Silas aside for ministry, he actually had the statement of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit said, remove Paul and Silas for this ministry I have, and it's a quotation. Excellent. So you have you have a quote that the only can only attribute to a person. Correct. It's always referred to not a gift or that like correct a Mormon or a Jehovah Witness would say, but it's a person, someone you, you interact with. Like yes. Yourself. So a couple of those comments, just summarizing for our Zoom folks, right? We we have the Holy Spirit being quoted as speaking. In the book of Acts, and of course, speaking is a is a factor for a human being, but also the scripture refers to the Holy Spirit as a he, not an it, as an energy or an aura. So he has being to him. Another response? Yes. So, so the Holy Spirit has characteristics as a being. He can be grieved, and of course, he produces uh, emotion in us, love and joy and things like that. So um, the, these are important factors. Now, typically we measure personhood. How do we know what a person is? By three things, intellect, emotion, and will. Those three factors we look at as being attributes of personhood. All of those are assigned to the Holy Spirit, uh, Spirit in Scripture. The Holy Spirit has a mind. He has an intellect, Romans eight twenty seven talks about the mind of the spirit, right? Versus the uh, sinful mind or carnal mind that we have. And we find that the Holy Spirit has emotion, as has been said. The Holy Spirit can be grieved. He can be insulted as a human being, Hebrews 10, 29. The Holy Spirit loves and uh, uh, the Trinity and uh, the, the salvation work of Christ, Galatians 5, 22 and following. And of course, the Holy Spirit has a will. He has, he has choosing ability. So he distributes gifts. We'll hopefully hit that one tonight, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 11. And of course, he regenerates. He, he makes individual people alive in Jesus Christ. So those attributes that Holy Scripture says about the Holy Spirit uh, leads us obviously concretely to believe, yes, he is a person. The Holy Spirit is not just like electricity or a new age energy. He is a real being. So uh, a couple of word pictures the uh, New Testament and Old Testament gives us. Can you think right now, our live class, what are some word pictures that are given to us about the Holy Spirit? Did something just happen to my mic? Did I, did I just go dead? Some you can sit. Can my can my Zoom friends still meet? Something happened with my mic just right now. Okay, so we're going to talk about word pictures that the Bible uses for the Holy Spirit. Can you brainstorm some of them? Well, it's viewed as wind. Okay. Yes. So the Holy Spirit is a word picture used for as wind. There we go. A dove. That's a second word picture. Um, the, yes, the tongue of fire at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit pictured that way. Does that see maybe this will trigger other word pictures used of him? So the Bible uses many different word pictures, but d don't you know, don't think then that that takes away from him being a being. It helps us, of course, to relate to him because, of course, the Holy Spirit is immaterial, right? He is not, he's not a physical being, he still has being of personhood like the Trinity. Any other? Word pictures coming to mind? Uh, oil. Being anointed. Yes. Anointing with oil. The Holy Spirit is pictured as oil. That's excellent. I appreciate that one. So there's a couple other, and uh, John MacArthur wrote these down. He categorized the word pictures. I thought it was helpful for my sake. So we have word pictures of the Holy Spirit from the natural world. Those include, of course, we've mentioned the dove, fire, oil, He's pictured as water uh, and wind. And then there are several pictures of the Holy Spirit drawn from the legal world. Uh, he is a pledge and a seal. 
And then we have some word pictures of the Holy Spirit from the domestic world, namely clothing, that we are to clothe ourselves even with the Spirit of Christ. Uh, and then uh, the, the word pictures of water and wind are the only two that we find used of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. The rest of those, of course, were New Testament type pictures. So for tonight, that's kind of our general introduction. Uh, my, my goal for tonight, actually, I'm not going to be following the Grudem text like I normally do. I decided this week, I hope that was by the Holy Spirit, to uh, branch out. So I've created my own outline, which is what you have before us. But as you folks already know, covering the topic of the Holy Spirit in, you know, 60 minutes or less is impossible. So here's what we're going to do. So right now, our live group and our Zoom group, you're going you're to right now discuss which of the topics of the Holy Spirit do you most want to cover tonight? I will not be covering the whole outline that I've sent to you. Now, if all of you will notice on the outline, if you were able to print it, there are 11 boxes on the outline. Of course, minus my opening title box, which is at the upper left corner. But there are 11 subjects related to the Holy Spirit that are boxed. The first one is letter A, regeneration. The second one, number three, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit and apostasy. Does everybody see those boxes on your outline? What I'm asking Zoom to do, what I'm asking my live class to do right now is decide the top three that you want covered because we will not cover the whole outline. It will be impossible. So right now, do some discussion amongst you on Zoom. And for our live class, please talk over each table. We have to agree. Which, which three do you most want to cover? And then I'll, I'll start with the live group and cover that topic. Then I'll choose the top one of Zoom and do that topic. And we'll go back and forth until time runs out. Does that make sense? Everybody, so I need somebody on Zoom to chat to me and tell me your top three. Otherwise, I won't know what you want unless you write it on a piece of paper and hold it up to me like this. OK, either way. But I need to know and we don't want to take a long time doing this. So let's give you uh, two, three, two, three minutes at most uh, right now. Decide which top three boxes. There are 11 boxes. You're going to choose number one, number two, and number three that you want discussed, okay? So go for it. So talk out loud and convince each other. I would like number three. I pick number three as well. If it's boxed, that's, that's fair game. Anything boxed. Yeah, it doesn't have to be a letter or number. Anything boxed. Yeah. So, we like we like stealing. We like blasphemy. That's two so far. Yeah, that's what was the I'm interested in too. The blasphemy. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Change my batteries and see if I can get my pacemaker to work again. <laughs> test test. <laughs> It helps a little bit to carry. All right, so that's it. Blasphemy is one. Okay. Okay. Then filling of the spirit, and then what else? I think somebody else is supposed to write. Yeah. So who's gonna? I put the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Somebody put the filling of the spirit. And we need one more. Indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Let letter B, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Sure. I can't see the outline, so I'll have to take it from you guys. All right, I put them on there. I think he'll be able to hear well, one of us he, uh, when he asks us. He'll be able to hear us. We got. We, we could Sorry, write it in the chat as well. I did. 
I already put it in. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, I put it in the chat too, but I don't know if anybody saw it. Yeah, don't anybody else write? Because I already have all three of them there. So if everybody starts writing, he's not going to know. Oh, he's looking. Why don't you show him? He's he's looking at us. I think. Why don't you hold it up to your screen? I don't have anything written. Oh, I thought you said you wrote it. I wrote it in the chat. Oh, God. And that's God. why I said nobody else yeah. writing in the chat. I hadn't, I hadn't even looked over it, chat. Yeah. Yeah. I was looking over it. Okay. What are the other two again? What did you guys want? The ceiling of the Holy I mean, I like the ceiling, but. Well, we can get more than one. Yeah. Faye, did you say the baptism of the Holy Spirit? She was. Oh, that was me. And she, wanted, she, she was interested in that. Yeah, but. That okay. was just fine. Okay, what, what did we end up with here? Yeah, choices. Isn't that tough? You give people choices and it's just hard, right? But I thought this is more practical. Yeah, this is it's it, this is this is better than me always running out of time and never covering the whole topic, right? So what what did we pick our live class? What Okay, so we're going to start with those three: regeneration, sealing, and the uh, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Okay, and this is what I found on chat. Uh, from our Zoom friends. So, uh, of course, I, I'm reading from the bottom up, figuring the bottom one was the first one. I have sealing, filling, and indwelling from Zoom. The, the fourth one was blasphemy. So, so, okay, is that not what you want? Because uh, the first chat was sealing, filling, and dwelling. So, respond somehow, Zoom folks, respond. Blasphemy. Okay, Luann is pointing straight down. That doesn't help, Luann. It doesn't help, right? I mean, what 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 do you what do you mean? Those were the four that were on your list. So, do you want those four or not? I need uh, Debbie or somebody to to communicate. Uh, Jim says fine. Okay, that's what I'm going to go for instead of trying to figure out what what that means. Okay, so you put blasphemy and you want that one first. Okay. Well, the other group picked that one too. So we will make sure that that gets covered right at some point. Okay. We're going to start with the uh, regeneration then uh, since the live class picked that one. That was the first one anyway. Okay. So have your Bibles nearby because we're going to do some searching and this is the best way that things can be uh, covered. If you've got your Bible, you already see the scriptures that'll be covered in that. Oh, sure. Uh, the scriptures that will be covered in this section are all typed uh, in your outline. So uh, make sure you're paging at your table to all the passages, right? I mean, spread the passages around so we'll cover more scripture faster if you've already looked up some of the passages that we have there, okay? So let's start simply with, this, with, with the question, what is this work of the Holy Spirit? What is regeneration? What is he doing in this particular work that he does, live class. Here we go. Start over or to give new, but in this case, it's new life. Yes. So in regeneration, the, the specific work is the Holy Spirit creating new life in me, a sinner who is separated from God. So this is the first work that we're going to be looking at here. Now, folks, uh, if we don't cover enough of this topic, it comes again February 10th. The discussion of regeneration will be on February 10th in our outline because all of you have the bookmark of, of the chapters we're reading. Grudem will cover the doctrine of regeneration specifically on February 10th. So if we don't cover it all tonight, it's still coming. And I hope that that, uh, that piques your curiosity, right? So we know that this means that the Holy Spirit makes me alive to God. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. All of us are born in what condition? These are passages most all of you already know. What condition am I born in? Yes, I'm dead. 
That's why the doctrine of regeneration is absolutely critical and essential because apart from the Holy Spirit making me alive, that's what regenerate means. It means to make alive again. Apart from that, I cannot have a relationship with the living God. So we're going to um, uh, look then at some word pictures of regeneration, and that's where you see 1A, uh, 1B, 1C, 1D, right? Spiritual birth, spiritual cleansing, spiritual creation. By the way, all three of those occur in Titus 3, 5. So that's going to be one of our key passages. And then finally, spiritual resurrection um, is the fourth word picture. So let's start. If somebody in our live class is reading for us, and this is where for you Zoom folks, I won't obviously repeat every Bible verse read here. Hopefully you're open to Titus 3, 5, and you're going to get the same gist. Who's reading for us, please? Okay, Pam. <clears throat> Us, not because of righteous things we have done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. Excellent. So, folks, Pam just read for us Titus 3 5, and the word for regeneration in that verse is which word? Rebirth. Does everybody find that? Now, if you're using King James tonight, anybody King James in our live group? What what's the word for regeneration in, in Titus 3 5? Regeneration. regeneration. You see, King James used that exact word, the washing of regeneration. And how does it happen? Renewal by the Holy Spirit. He's the one who makes me alive again. So now, right now, for Zoom folks and live class. You want to be looking up the rest of the passages in that section so that we can cover all of them in a little quicker way. Now, the word in the NIV, rebirth, rebirth, the washing of rebirth, or the King James word regeneration. This is a Greek compound word uh, that's only found two times in Holy Scripture, right here, Titus 3, 5. Literally, it translates the two, you know, the compound word is two words put together. Literally translates again born. Again born. See, that's where uh, we get the English word regenerate. To generate is to make alive, like a generator. And then you add the prefix re to it. You're making it alive again. You're making it alive in this case, of course, for the first time. Uh, spiritually speaking, right? Regenerating is new spiritual life. This word to, to born again or to again born is found in uh, Matthew 19, verse 28, where uh, Jesus uses it there to speak of the earth being regenerated during the time of the millennium. So there is that process because he'll be living in Jerusalem and ruling from his throne. The word is used in there in that context as well, too. Now, Galatians 4, who's got it? Verse 29. Anybody? Galatians. This is a powerful verse on the subject of regeneration. Galatians 4, 29. Anybody in our live group? Mel, go ahead, please. At that time, some born in the ordinary way persecuted the sons born by the power of the Spirit. Okay, that phrase is so powerful. There are two sons who are born to Abraham. One is born how? Just the flesh, the ordinary way, the scripture says. But there's another son who is born how? The Holy Spirit, folks, that's the rebirth that is essential for salvation, right? The Holy Spirit making us alive again. So that verse uniquely covers that topic, to be born by the power of the Holy Spirit. He makes you alive when we were dead in our sins, right? So then we have some excellent verses, 1 Peter 1, 3. Anybody, please? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Excellent. We are begotten 
again, that verse said, correct? And uh, Ruth, if you'll drop down to verse 23 of the same chapter. Being born again, not a corruptible seed, but incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Okay, so we have again these phrases of born again. This is what regeneration is, and the Holy Spirit is the one to do it. Now, Jesus talking to Nicodemus. John chapter 3, verse 3 and 7. Who's got those for us? Those passages are probably most familiar to us as far as being regenerated or born again. Who's got them, please? Jesus replied, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Yes, unless they're born again. You cannot see God's kingdom unless you're born again. And verse 7, you've got the same thing too there, Pam, right? So let's just drop to 1 John 5, 1. Anybody here, Barry? Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. Okay. And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. Born of him. We So we have this theme of regeneration, born again, many times in sacred scripture. And 1 John 3, uh, 24, this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it how. By the spirit he has given us. So the spirit is specifically connected to the work of making us spiritually alive. That's the power of the doctrine of regeneration. So now we're going to drop to 1B here. 1B, the second word picture. So the first word picture of regeneration is spiritual birth, right? That's the first word picture. The second one, spiritual cleansing. Spiritual cleansing is the second word picture for regeneration. We're going back to Titus 3, verse 5, because this is the key verse that gives us many of these word pictures. Paul gave us this. He saved us through the washing of rebirth. So we first looked at the word rebirth, right? Titus 3, 5. Now we're going to look at the word washing. The word washing. So regeneration is pictured as a spiritual cleansing. What do I need to be washed from? What do I need to be cleansed from? Yes, it's a sin issue, which Isaiah 64, 6 reminds us of. Anybody here have Isaiah 64, 6, please? Go ahead, Mel. All of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous acts like grass are like filthy grains. We all shrivel up like a reed. And like the wind, our sins sweep us away. Wow. So in that verse, what are the words that describe spiritual the need for spiritual cleansing for us? Which words? Filth. So filth, yep, there, because that's related to cleansing, right? I, that my condition is filthy before God, and maybe the uh, an earlier word as well, too unclean so there's a word related of course to spiritual cleansing and thus we have the term washing in titus 3 5 okay now the term washing pops up again in ephesians 5 26 anybody here have that one that's in the context of what jesus is doing uh in us uh, with the picture of a uh, husband and wife right uh ephesians 5 26 please anybody reading there Okay, so here's this picture of spiritual cleansing. Jesus, by his word, powerfully washes us. He cleanses us with water. His word is like a, is a waterfall that washes us and cleanses us. It's the word that's doing that. And then 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 to 11, this passage, too, on spiritual cleansing is really important it reminds us, do not be deceived, Paul says. There's a whole list of sins that if people live perpetually in the sins, they don't inherit the kingdom of God, right? So sins of immorality and uh, a drunkenness and prostitution um, and thievery and greediness and drunkards, swindlers, people who perpetually live in those sins will not inherit the kingdom of God. Verse 11. But for the believers, verse 11, you were what? What's the word of spiritual cleansing? You were washed. 
See, so the theme of spiritual cleansing reminds us again, too, that regeneration is the work that the Holy Spirit does in people who are filthy. People who are dead, right, need to be regenerated. People who are filthy with sin, who cannot come into the presence of the Holy God, they are washed of their sin. Isn't that good news, right? So washed what? Uh, the, the word picture I love is, you know, Isaiah 1, 18, right? Though my sins are like what? Right outside your window. I'm sorry. Yeah, the reverse. Yeah, scarlet. They shall be white as snow, right? So the, the snow in winter, if you don't like it, I guess move south. But it's still a powerful word picture from sacred scripture. This is what the Holy Spirit does. He cleanses me uh, of all my sin because of the work of Jesus Christ. Okay? 1C. Here we go. We're talking about the third word picture of regeneration spiritual creation, spiritual creation. So we had spiritual birth, right? Spiritual cleansing. Now a third picture, spiritual creation. We're back in Titus 3, 5. It's a verse you just can't get away from on this topic of regeneration. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. We're going to now look at the word renewal. Renewal. Does everybody have that, Titus 3, 5? Are there any other translation uh, differences? Renewal. Titus 3, 5. I think that's that word is used in all the translations. This word, let's break it apart, though. This word is a compound word as well, too. A Greek compound word. Two words put together. Literally translates new again. New, N-E-W, again. So the Holy Spirit will wash me gives me a new birth, and he makes me new again, right? And the word new that the Holy Spirit caused Paul to use here in this particular verse, Titus 3, 5, is a word that means new in quality, new in quality versus new in time. So there are two words for new in the New Testament, N-E-W, two words for that. One of them is in quality, the substance of what you are made in Jesus Christ. You are quality. You are new versus new in time. I'm not so new in time. I'm getting older and decrepit all the time, <laughs> right? We're all on that treadmill of age. We're not new in time any longer, but someday, right? <laughs> I'll take my last breath and I'll take my first new breath, right? In the presence of Jesus Christ by his grace. And that's a whole different story. But here he's going to make me new again, there are many passages that talk about the Holy Spirit's work uh, because of what Christ has done to make us new. Can you think of one? And you might just quote one that's in your notes because you know what the verse says. If it's, uh, anybody, yes, if anyone is, in Christ, it, there it is. He's a new creature, a new creation. See, the same thing, the same thing, spiritual creation. You are a new creation in Christ when the Holy Spirit regenerates you. You're brand new and your quality. You're not an old antique that's worn out and used up. <laughs> Even though I kind of like antiques, you know that. You are new in Christ. You are made new because of the blood of Jesus, right? What you're saying is just renewal in a day when it happened to us hadn't grown old in us. Correct. It, the, the renewal has not grown old in us. It doesn't get worse. It's even in regeneration, even in the resurrection, or you saying yes. There, there is that quality of an agelessness when he makes me new in the blood of Jesus. Yes, that's a great, great thought. Isn't that great? So now we've got a couple passages again that use the concept of creation or newness. So we have Galatians six fifteen. Anybody? Galatians 6.15. Go ahead, Mel. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is a new creation. Aren't you glad for that? Yeah, we won't get real personal on that passage, will we, men? Right? What counts is that you're made new by the work of the Holy Spirit, right? That you're a person who's made new, not ceremonies or Jewish uh, rituals, 
from the Old Testament. That's not what counts. Ephesians 4, 24, we'll use the same concept of new creation. Anybody? Excellent. To put on the new self, which is created to be, how again? Like, like God. Isn't that something? That's how new is, right? So that's a powerful, powerful word picture. Let's get to the last word picture of regeneration, spiritual resurrection, spiritual resurrection. So here we're moving out of Titus 3.5. We've got two key passages to look at that are word pictures of regeneration. John 6, verse 63. Who's got that, please? Excellent. Let's look right away at what Pam read at the beginning of verse 63. The spirit gives life. That's a compound Greek verb right there. A compound, again, two Greek words put together that literally translates, he makes alive. He makes alive. The spirit makes alive, right? The flesh counts for nothing, right? You can work your whole life long and doing your good deeds and all of that. That doesn't count for anything. It's the Holy Spirit who makes dead people separated because of sin from God. He makes them alive. Isn't that a powerful verse? See, regeneration. He's doing that, right? I mean, go ahead and take your um, jumper cables from your car, right, George? Hook them up to your battery in your car and hook them up to your skin. See what happens. You're going to jump, aren't you? Right. This is a bigger jump when God, the Holy Spirit, enters the life of a dead person separated from God. This is a much bigger jump. He makes you alive. He makes you alive and he gives you a life that you would never create on your own. You just can't. We can't. Right. I can't make myself new again. Uh, but God, by the Holy Spirit, enters in and does it. And then we have Second Corinthians 3, 6. Let's read that one yet. Before we pass off of that topic, who's got that, please? Go ahead, Mel. He has made us competent as ministers of the new covenant. Not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Isn't that great? The spirit gives life. He makes alive. The Holy Spirit is the one who makes me alive again. So his ministry of regenerating people, when they hear the gospel are convicted of, of sin when they are pointed toward Jesus Christ and the cross, right? And, and that moment occurs when that sinner believes on Christ saying, I need you, Jesus, to be my savior. Regeneration occurs. And that's very, very exciting, okay? Well, we have just one more point on your outline. What about Old Testament believers? Uh, were they regenerated the same way that New Testament believers are regenerated so that question is interesting, and it comes up because was the Holy Spirit working to regenerate the same way in the Old Testament as in the New? Now, we find many differences the way the Holy Spirit works and ministers in the Old and New, but we have a couple of passages just to remind us, and they're, by the way, they're all from the New Testament here. We know from John 3, 7 that you must be born again to enter the kingdom of God. So that had to be true for, for Old Testament believers as well, too. They had to be born again. They had to be regenerated the same way that sinners are even today. Our example that Old Testament believers were regenerated by the Holy Spirit the same as us is Romans 4, verse 3. Romans 4, verse 3. And the Old Testament figure in that verse is Abraham. He believed God. The essence of the gospel is believing the good news of God, that he's the only one who can make me alive. Abraham believed God, and it was credited him as righteousness. So that work of Abraham believing God is the work of the Holy Spirit to make him alive again, right? Because no one can say, you know, God is my Lord except by the Holy Spirit. We know that. So we are going to say that the Holy Spirit regenerated people in the Old Testament in the same way. They looked ahead, right, to Christ who would die for them in, in their future. We look backwards 
and we trust in Christ who died for us uh, before we came along. So the work of regeneration, the scripture says there is no particular difference uh, between an Old Testament believer and a new. Go ahead. The thing with, um, with Nicodemus is that Jesus criticized them. Why? Because this is something he should have been teaching. Yes. So, he, so as a Jewish rabbi, yes. something the Jewish rabbi should have been teaching that the wind comes, I mean, the spirit comes and regenerates and everything away, Jesus says, and you can be an rabbi, why are you teaching this? Because this is the way it's been going on. Yes. So that comment, uh, again, was Jesus was, was um, criticizing Nicodemus, John chapter 3, because he should have known all these things of regeneration of the spirit because he's a teacher of Israel, right? He knows the Old Testament backwards and forwards, and yet he himself hadn't even come to God yet in the same way, right? So thanks. That's very, very helpful at that point. Friends, just as we close, because now that's the end of this particular topic uh, for tonight. A personal question, though, right? How do you know tonight, brothers and sisters on Zoom and live class, how do you know tonight that you are born again? How do you know that you're regenerated? Because we can talk about Bible doctrine and be like Nicodemus. Or these truths, right, uh, are, are real for us. Does anybody care to respond to that? How do you know that you are born again, regenerated? You know your whole dead Okay, so we had one comment said, yes, I see where my life was. My dead self was the comment that was made. And now I see there's a newness to me, which I could not have cooked up in the kitchen myself, right? That's very helpful. Anyone else? Please. The inherent word of God tells us okay. that. Okay, that's super powerful too, right? The word of God tells me so. And I believe this word because the Holy Spirit breathed it out, right? That when I, uh, you know, Romans 10 or so forth, uh, uh, confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. The word of God says so. And I take the word of God literally, correct? Uh, go ahead, please. And then we'll guess, go there. The one I have is that the, the Spirit testifies to my spirit that I'm sent up. So Excellent. It's eternal, I'm known to, I know myself, I can't prove it to her. Yes. But it is a witness to me personally. It's a witness to you happen. that the spirit testifies to my spirit that I am a child of God. That one is super important. Like Mike just said, I can't prove that internal witness to you, except we're going to come later, perhaps to a passage. By, by their fruit, you will know them. So in that way, you could look at the fruit of my life and say, that person is new again, or that person's living in the flesh, you see? But that's critically important, that I myself have the witness of the Holy Spirit in my mind and my heart, which says, you're a child of God. Now, now I'm going to live that way, right? I'm, I don't want to live a, aside from that identity which Christ died to give to me. So that's super important. Let's go here, please. What, what, what Mike just said. Okay, <laughs> excellent. <laughs> I, that that pass, and that's that's Romans eight, isn't it? Romans eight, verse I forget nine ish, ten ish. Also, okay, First John 2. Anyone else yet? How can I know I'm born again? I mean, we folks, we can't be wrong on this, can we? We can't be confused on this. Please. It says examine yourselves to see whether you be in the faith. And I think he was talking in the context of look at your life. Are yes. you producing the fruit? Or do you hate sin? Are you walking with God? Do you have faith? You know, are those things of God working in your life? Excellent examine yourself, it says Corinthians, test yourself to see if you are in the faith. Well, you have to know what is the faith that God has called you to. Is your life walking in the faith, which scripture records for us? So that's super important too. Okay. I have a Well, piece that's of... powerful enough, isn't it? Regeneration and, and his work. So I pray the blessing of that has been refreshed for, for every one of us uh, tonight who have trusted in Christ, right? Okay, now we're moving to the first selection of the Zoomers, which I believe then was to be blasphemy. Is that right? Which is actually the next one in the outline. Is that the first one that the Zoomers want addressed? Okay, I see a thumbs up from one person there. That's what we're going to do. 
Okay, so now we're looking at topic number two, doctrine number two here. And this follows sequentially uh, in the outline. So maybe that makes sense as well, too. We're going to remind ourselves again of what this, this scripture says about blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. And uh, a related, of course, sin is the sin of apostasy. Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit and apostasy. First of all, so we'll, ha we'll have to rely on our live class to answer some of the questions, even though this is the Zoom topic. What is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit? What is it? What is that sin? Uh, attributing to evil spirits what the Holy Spirit did? Yes, very powerful. Attributing to evil spirits what the Holy Spirit did. And that's powerful the way Barry said that because, of course, we're studying the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. This is a blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is a specific sin, which the Bible then says is non-forgivable. It cannot be forgiven. So we're going to review that now. And uh, it, it does give the Zoom folks a chance to send a direct question or comment via chat because we're going to look up some of these scriptures. So please do that immediately. Don't wait for the end of the hour uh, if there's a, a follow-up from Zoom. So we're at Matthew 12. We're going to go to that text primarily tonight, Matthew 12, 31 and 32. We'll ask our, our live class to read that. This, the, this sin against the Holy Spirit is mentioned in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So the three synoptic gospels have the same references. All of those texts are typed into your notes. So Matthew 12, 31 and 32, reading for us, please. Wherefore I say unto you, all men are sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him, but whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Okay, so hopefully, folks on Zoom, you've looked at that primary verse to Matthew 12, 31, 32. Let your eye glance upwards at verse 24 of Matthew chapter 12. Here's the context. Barry was mentioning this just a moment ago. Matthew 24, the Pharisees, seeing Jesus do miraculous signs, and in this context, there was a healing of a man who was, uh, let's see, lame and mute. Is that correct? At the top of the text, Jesus had healed a man and the healing, uh, the people are crediting that to this must be the son of David who is doing this. And yet the Pharisees who see the same healing, this miraculous deliverance, they say in verse 24, it's only by Beelzebub, the prince of demons, that this fellow drives out demons. So crediting the power of the Holy Spirit to uh, a demonic force is the sin against the Holy Spirit. When you clearly see an act that only God himself could do, only God could heal this man who was lame and, and uh, mute, and you credit that miraculous deliverance and power to the power of Satan. That is the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. And Jesus says it's a sin which is unforgivable because when you've assigned the power of God himself, the Holy Spirit, to the devil, there is nobody who can come back and give you conviction of sin any longer. The Holy Spirit, whom you have just now assigned to be the power of the devil, your mind and conscience has been seared to the point that you can no longer receive the convicting work of the Holy Spirit because you have just assigned his power uh, which is meant to be for our positive good, you've assigned it to Satan. Is there another way of committing that same sin without using those exact words, saying you're doing it by the power of the devil? Because people can have a seared conscience just from not listening. Oh, yes. You know, so I think with the way we're saying it is so specific that we're going to say, who does that sin? I mean, they did it in that context because they were right with Jesus, but ignoring God and ignoring his conviction, maybe is doing the same thing in spirit if not using the exact same word. Sure, sure. Um, it, it's Paul to Timothy that talks about people in the last days having, you know, a conscience which is seared as with a hot iron, 
and no longer receive that. Uh, our, our discernment ability, though, becomes difficult because we ourselves may not exactly be able to understand when a person has reached that point. And we don't know as far as, you know, but don't for, again, external fruit is the only thing that we can measure uh, as far as is there any life left in a particular person by the fruit that they're demonstrating. We may not know. So uh, that, that one, as far as who, who, is, who exactly has committed that sin, uh, of course, we leave that one to, um, you know, to, to God himself to make that judgment in, in the last days. And another verse or comment, Ruth, was it, Timothy, you looked up? Uh, Acts. Acts. And Saul are um, going to, they went to, I think it was Cyprus, Cyprus, and they were giving the gospel out there. And when they stood up to preach in the synagogue, or they went on the papals, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew, whose name is Bar Jesus. And what did he say? Um, they wanted to hear the word of God, but Elymas, the sorcerer, uh, withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. And then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him and said, Oh, O oh, full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, folk, thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord. And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell a mist on him in darkness, and he went about seeking something that lead him by the hand. I don't think he's kind of the same situation. Is that similar? And the text again, Ruth was just reading a lengthy text, Acts chapter 10. Acts 13, 6 and follow, with Elymas, Elymas, the sorcerer, Right, who, who is looking Jewish uh, in in his work and ministry to many people, but is 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 he even uh, a believer? Is the question at all? Um, so Ruth was raising that as a possible example, you know, of of blasphemy that way. Darkness came over to him. Go ahead. Is this uh, an example of Paul using judgment or using discernment? Oh, Barry. <laughs> yeah, is Paul using judgment or is he using yeah, discernment? Yes. That's yeah. Was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost. Yes. Him yeah, filled with the, that's one of our examples of filling. Yeah. So he he knew the the parent condition the Holy Spirit at least gave him that understanding or knowledge about elements Acts chapter 13. So yeah, are are we the, the question was kind of are we limiting uh this particular sin and that it'd be so tight of a condition that nobody actually would ever uh commit this sin? Well, God God forbid that people should, right? I mean, we're all in that place. We sure don't want people to blaspheme the Holy Spirit, assigning the power of Jesus. Now, there are some folks you understand who would say this sin isn't isn't uh, able to be committed any longer because Jesus isn't here doing miracles any longer. So in that sense, some people say, yes, the, the, you, you won't see this sin being committed now because you're not witnessing mir Jesus doing miracles alive in 2021. Perhaps not in the United States. Yes, in some places, then you'd say, uh, maybe this this scripture text would make more sense than in places where you know God's Spirit is doing new or uh, beginning works among people, and then people deciding is this is this of God or is this not? Uh, but we may not may not see that in in this particular course. Yeah, I'm just concerned that if if it's a broader definition, uh, we're making it so narrow that people would never even think to be convicted of something like that. You know sure. What I mean? Sure. Well, you know, he, yes, and and then I guess Barry comes to your your question, which is a great question. You know, is are we making a judgment or is this a discernment issue? When when people when when people speak against you know Holy Scripture, when people speak against Jesus Christ Himself, no, I mean that that happens all the time, all the time. A word against the Son of Man can is forgiven. Yeah, a word against Christ is forgivable, but but uh, assigning yeah. To, so there, he made it pretty specific, as you're reminding us of that. Although they were speaking against his miracles, and they said it's done by the power of the devil. The devil. They're speaking about Christ's miracles. Yes, his miracles. Right. Well, add to this then the the question of apostasy. What is apostasy? Um, and, and here this, this becomes even more difficult for some uh, folks. And we're going to look at the Hebrew 6 text, if you have that um, open 
uh, in front of you, Hebrews 6 and Hebrews, uh, yeah, Hebrews 6. There, this, this particular text, this came up, by the way, in Grudem, although he didn't cite the text, Hebrews 6. It was on page 647, near the end of our reading tonight. Hebrews chapter 6, where there the writer in Hebrews, this, this becomes uh, one of the great texts that I think is, is uh, disputed by many Christians. Is the text talking about believers who can fall away from salvation? Or is the text Hebrews 6, 4 to 6 talking about folks who have a uh, wannabe profession of faith, um, a, a um, imposter uh, confession of faith? They're folks who have hung out uh, among Christianity long enough to know the talk and the walk, but they're not truly or genuinely saved. So that's where this text becomes difficult, Hebrews 6, 4 to 6. There the writer says, though, it is impossible Verse four, it is impossible. And if you'll jump right away then to, you know, if you've enjoyed the Holy Spirit and tasted of of heavenly gifts and fruit and things, verse six, if they fall away, if they decide, no, this is not for me to be brought back to repentance uh, because to their loss, they're crucifying the son of God all over again. And if his first death wasn't atoning for you, uh, for, for, for you to fall away, then there's no possibility for the grace of God to come to you as well, too. So, um, you know what? Everybody has to decide on this one. I myself believe this is talking about unbelievers. Hebrews 6, 4 to 6 is talking about unbelievers, people who have somewhat of, uh, like, like a Nicodemus, something of what sounds like a credible profession of faith, but they're not saved. They're not saved. Folks, Jesus said, this shouldn't surprise us, that in Washera Community Church, there are two groups of people. They are the wheat and the tares. It shocks us always when we think of this, because when I look around, I say, boy, you are all nice, good, shiny Christian people. We say that instinctively, but without discerning a person's testimony and knowing their testimony and and looking at their fruit, right, or, you know, getting into the nitty gritty of it, you know, we may be making false judgments about people that the person sitting right next to us is actually a weed, a tear. Jesus said there'd be people who would look exactly like you and they'll be with you till Christ comes back. And then he's going to separate goats and sheep, right? On the great day of judgment. So it shouldn't surprise us in, in my humble, I'm, I'm, I'm adamant about it, but I, you know, a humble estimation of Hebrews 6. It's, these are folks who are not saved, who have not come to a genuine saving faith with Jesus, and then they turn away and say, well, you know, it's getting thick now because it's getting hotter in the Christian church, and, you know, persecution or such might chase them away. And I offer to you verse 9 of Hebrews 6 as the fact that the writer to Hebrews was even indicating that there in verse 9, he's talking to the believers, right? Even though we speak like this, dear friends, a very hard section, verses 4 to 6, we're confident of better things in your case, things that accompany salvation. So in verse 9, he's indicating that he's talking to the believers, while in verses 4 to 6, he was talking to non-believers in 4 to 6. But if you haven't used Christ's first crucifixion for your salvation, why can't you use it later? You know what I mean? The, the text says, Ruth, I can only tell you what the text says. It's because you are you are crucifying the Son of God all over again. You know what I mean? In other words, he's saying you can't be saved twice. You can only be saved once because Christ died once to be saved once. If you fall away, you're not going to be saved again. Yeah, you cannot. You cannot. Okay. So I understand there's folks who will disagree. You believe that believers can lose their salvation. And I, I, I'm not, I'm not. yeah, I need you to support that from the rest of Holy Scripture, because of course we'll never take Scripture out of context. So, so this is where again Christians have come down the line where yes, believers uh, can lose their salvation or believers cannot, and you know that's that's where the heart of this sin of blasphemy then comes in. See. So there we're going to look at uh, 1 John 2, verse 19. 1 John 2, 19. This is the verse that has classically been used then 
uh, to help us understand why are there some people that hang out with uh, Christians or Christianity and then decide not to any longer. So there, you know, we cite this verse, and sometimes I suppose it's it's used more as a, a, a as a um, club against folks, but they went out from us because John says they they did not really belong to us. So there's there's this kind of teaching in First John two that there are some folks who have hung out with you, but they don't stay with you. And in this case, he says, if they had belonged to us, they would have stayed or remained with us, but their going shows that none of them belong to us. So there somehow he is discerning that people who have walked away from Christ or Christianity weren't saved in the first place. Now, if you take those texts to mean you can lose your salvation, um, I, I guess you'll have to support that. I think it is very people who have walked away who were never saved. I think that's pretty clear in the scripture. Okay. Never were saved and acted like it, and eventually their true side came out. Sure. Yeah, when the heat gets turned on, uh, you know, as far as. Uh, well, I suppose lots of reasons that people may leave. They don't want to go through the discipline or the Sure. A humble obedience to God after a while, consistent obedience. Sure. Then we have um, the Second Peter 2 passage, which is also pertinent at this point. Here, Peter talking. So we're looking at other texts related to, you know, blasphemy and apostasy. If they have escaped the corruption of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and are again entangled in it and overcome, they're worse off at the end than they were at the beginning. And it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than to have known it and then to turn their backs on the sacred commandment. So, see, these passages we connect here because they're in this related theme of, uh, of an inability to come back to salvation, um, and, and so again, this one might be one where folks would say, yes, they, they, they came to know savingly our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and then they turn away or reject it. Um, so you'll have to, um, you know, understand that verse in those kind of contexts. Some folks will say they know him savingly, and some folks will read that verse and say they, they knew him intellectually, but just knowing G- Satan knows Jesus. Satan knows Jesus, James 2, 19, and he's not saved. So um, it's not it's not like you can just, oops, I lost my salvation. It's not that easy. And you don't lose it just by sinning because our sins are covered. But it's a willingly, a willing, knowing, absolutely rejecting and turning the other way. It's speaking against God and Christ and everything. It's not just, oops, I my sin, so I lost sure, my salvation. Sure, sure. And, and one factor to, to, that, that has to be... Sure, but you're weighing it. You're weighing these scriptures. One factor we haven't included at all in this is, does God have anything to do with keeping the people that he's regenerated? And, and does, God, does, God, does God lose some of the people that the Holy Spirit regenerated? Jesus says, I've lost another one that you've given. Yeah. So that, you see, we've been talking all from our perspective of, 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 believe, of people, whether believers or unbelievers, committing blasphemy or apostasy, turning away. Uh, and, and But we haven't touched any of the texts of, does God keep the people that he regenerates? Yeah, so, Judas. Judas? Yeah. Do you hold to the view that Judas have regeneration and lost it, or do you need yeah. Or do you hold what Jesus said when you cleaning the disciples' feet? Not all of you are clean. Right. So it implies that Judas was never clean, even in, in the whole three years of his ministry, yeah. he never had a cleanse. The other 11 had it, were clean, but he didn't. Yeah, I think that's an important verse. Yeah, Judas was being mentioned here, folks. I mean, what about um, backsliding? Are backsliders lost? Yeah, are backsliders or lost? Just bad Christian so. acting bad. Or, or are they Christians acting badly that, yeah, you know, yeah. sure. Read the whole letter, there are a lot of Christians that acting darn bad. Yes, it, it, yes. Going to prostitutes and everything, yeah. involved arguing, don't do that. Right. You can't go to the, the temple and worship 
Diana and, and then go to the temple and then go to the Lord's Supper or sit at the Lord's Supper. You can't even right. forbid that. The Muslim Christians were taken. They were taken. The weak Christians were them called them problems. I mean, but he still called them brothers and sisters in Christ. Right. So he not tried just, to correct not problems. just sinning and people can backslide. Mm hmm. But rejecting God, rejecting Christ. Yeah, blasphemy is is a turn, a decisive assigning or turning away from God. Yeah, it can't can't come back again. And then I just remind you, Second Thessalonians two verse three, um, that Paul prophesies, of course, that there's a day coming, uh, you know, near the tribulation here when the when the falling away will happen. The rebellion or the apostasy, NAS is the only translation that used the word apostasy, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 3. When the Antichrist, uh, you know, is coming on the scene, uh, don't, don't be deceived uh, because there'll be a, a falling away, right? The man of lawlessness when he's revealed. And that's something that that's still coming. And then there'll be a great uh, departure and um, I'll, I'll leave that to you to wager. Is that departure believers or is that departure just, you know, uh, wheat, weeds, weeds that look like wheat? See? So, um, but a, a very important one. So, uh, obviously, we've already entered into the question, which, you know, needs to uh, be processed throughout all of Holy Scripture. Yeah, can a believer commit these sins? Can a believer commit them? So that's one, of course, that you take your needle and thread. And we, we simply had to go through all of Holy Scripture to, um, you know, to answer that. But, you know, God, God forbid, I guess, right, that uh, that I turn the Holy Spirit off in my mind so much that, yeah, my conscience had become so seared that that I wouldn't want to go back. Did I get any comments, questions, or from zoomers did i get anything so um he was out of fellowship but didn't totally reject so i i don't know this oh prodigal son what about the prodigal son um yeah so <laughs> is that a question of was the prodigal son saved and then unsaved and then saved again is is that what zoomers were zooming about Saved, unsaved. Well, I just don't know the scenario when and scriptures would just say, yeah, you couldn't be saved, unsaved, and saved again. So that scenario is not biblical. It, it, so we, you couldn't start with that. Um, prodigal, in it, it's, its very nature suggests, I think, what some of the discussion was here already, that back, was it backslidden or what word? Backsliding. backsliding. A believer like Corinthians is the key example of folks who who are not called unbelievers at that point, but their sins were heinous before God, right? Backslidden Wor or worldly. Doesn't he use that term, Mike? Worldly. You are worldly. You are not of the spirit. Carnal. Carnal. Okay. You're acting like mere men, which is to say, yeah, what of the Holy Spirit is in you right now? You're acting like an unbelieving. He doesn't tell them to be saved. He tells them to repent. Yeah. Right. The same thing. Repentance. He doesn't say, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure of your salvation. You're not acting like someone who's going to judge angels. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, and have the discernment to judge angels. Yeah. Don't you know that, yeah, we're going to judge, judge angels at the end. Right. Well, uh, fruitful discussion. I sure appreciate that. And. Hope that was helpful for folks. Now we get to go to uh, the second discussion of our lab class, which was sealing, sealing. And that's a super one. Actually, that may help us best uh, when we think about uh, this believers falling from salvation. Let's talk about the doctrine of the Holy Spirit sealing. Because, of course, in the end, we can't have a divided Holy Spirit. So we're turning to... Uh, the doctrine of uh, the Holy Spirit's work of sealing. So what does this mean? What does it mean that we are sealed by the Holy Spirit? We're still in the, the category of the section of salvation, uh, what the Holy Spirit is doing you know, in us regarding salvation. And we're going to talk about his work of sealing. So there's a couple primary texts because there aren't many that use this term. So you'll want to have Ephesians 1. Uh, open and Ephesians 4 and, and 2 Corinthians 1. We're going to look at those. 
and we'll talk about that along the way. So um, there are two word pictures that are used from Ephesians chapter 1 that talk about this work of the Holy Spirit. This is a work which is simultaneous at the time of regeneration. The work of sealing you by the Holy Spirit is an action of the Holy Spirit that occurs at the same time as we've talked about regeneration, right? At the moment of, of your being made alive again. And the two word pictures are a seal and a deposit, a seal and a deposit. Now, a seal was an imprint into soft wax. Do any of you actually do that on letters or cards anymore? You know, you melt uh, the wax stick, um, you know, with a flame or with a candle, and you put wet wax on the edge of a, of a uh, like a wedding invitation or a baby shower or something like that, right? And we actually did it for VBS one year. Uh, we did some some wax sealing. And then you put an imprint in the wet wax, and that seal or that imprint in the wet wax identifies either the document or the property that the wax is on uh, as belonging to the owner uh, of the seal. So the term seal is found 17 times in the New Testament, something that's sealed. And then we get the term deposit, which is a banking or a financial term. And the term deposit means some initial installment which has been made and uh, it secures a legal claim. So when you folks got a home mortgage, you put a deposit down, right, on the purchase of a house. That deposit was uh, your uh, legal uh, right to that um, the property. I mean, you were living in it. You didn't have to. Uh, wait till you paid the whole house off before you moved in, right? But it also was the initial installment that uh, obligates you to uh, further payments, correct? A deposit means you're going to you're going to faithfully make other payments. So here we have Ephesians one thirteen reading for us. There, anybody in our live group? Ephesians one thirteen. And you also were included in Christ when you the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. Okay, excellent. So we got there, right? So here Paul's talking about that point when you were included in Christ, you were put into the family of believers. You came to that point when you heard the word of truth, right? The gospel of your salvation, that you're a sinner who needs Jesus Christ. And you believed. So it's talking about some objective things and some subjective things all at the same time. You believed the word of truth. And at that point of regeneration, sealing also takes place. You were marked in him with a seal. So it's a, a very long uh, translation there, marked with a seal. And the seal that marked you was the Holy Spirit. So this doctrine means the Holy Spirit has sealed you as being the property of God. Kind of like branding. Maybe. Kind of like a branding. Now, it's interesting you, you mentioned that, and we'll, we'll, we'll make that clear uh, as, as clear as we can briefly. There is a time in the a tribulation time period when people will be branded. There is a different word when uh, people, uh, unbelievers, will receive the mark of the beast, 666, either on their foreheads or on their right wrist. That's a word that literally in Greek is a branding, a branding, where the word sealing, don't forget the 144,000 in the tribulation time period, uh, Jewish evangelists, they are sealed, which means they're protected by God and cannot be harmed by uh, the Antichrist. Uh, or by his deception. So the, the two words are actually quite important in that context. A sealing is for believers. A branding is for the unbelievers. Two separate things. So here you're sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. He's called promised because, of course, Jesus said he's not coming until I take off, right? Until I leave. And then we read in verse, uh, let's just finish the picture of sealing. Chapter 4, verse 30 of Ephesians. Who has that, please? Chapter 4, verse 30. Go ahead. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, 
with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Now, this catch, catches my attention because, I mean, it's a precious promise, which is objective. When the Holy Spirit seals an individual, how long are they sealed for? Until redemption, the day of redemption, which is when you get a new glorified body with him. You're going to be kept by the Holy Spirit until you die in this life and are resurrected with a new body. I think that's, an, for me, that's an objective truth why I believe that a believer cannot fall away from salvation. You're sealed by the Holy Spirit. It's not my sealing. I mean, I'm not sealing myself, convincing myself. It's the Holy Spirit who seals me. And then we're going to read 2 Corinthians 1, 21 and 22. Uh, Barry has that, please. 2 Corinthians 1. Go ahead. And it is God who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us and who has also put his seal on us and given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee or a down payment. Excellent. Now, here, this verse is powerful because it combined both pictures of this work of the Holy Spirit. A seal is put on us, and this seal guarantees, of course, that God, you know, he who began a good work will carry it out until the day of redemption, will carry it out until it's completed. So uh, the, some of the other references to seals in the New Testament were uh, on Jesus' tomb, Matthew 27, 66, that's just that reference. They put a seal on the tomb, right? So that it's a tamper-proof mark. You can't go and steal this body, right? The body of Jesus. The same word seal there. Revelation 20, verse 3. In the uh, time of the millennium, Revelation 20, verse 3, the angel locks Satan in the abyss and puts a seal over the door of the abyss, meaning, you know, this is tamper-proof. He's not going to get out for a thousand years, right, during the millennial time period. So the same term is used there. And then we get to uh, verse 14 of Ephesians 1. Here's the second picture of this work of the Holy Spirit. Anybody? Ephesians 1, 14. So we read verse 13 that talked about the seal. Now verse 14. We have had guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession. Okay, that's a powerful word too. See, a deposit. So the Holy Spirit is a deposit, the NIV translates there, which guarantees the inheritance which God is going to give to his children, right? Until, again, this phrase, until the redemption. So the, your mortal body is going to die and he's going to give you a resurrected new body until the redemption of those who are God's possession. Now, if, if, if you're God's possession, I just don't see how he can break his seal. Or I don't see how I can break that seal. To me, this is objective truth, which just is so encouraging. Um, he's, he who redeems me is going to keep me, right? Uh, n- n- none shall he lose out of the palm of his hand. He's going to keep me. So the doctrine of the Holy Spirit regenerating me and sealing me to me, are a powerful compliment that a believer, I don't believe a believer can fall away from salvation. I just don't. I don't believe. Otherwise, I have, otherwise I have to understand the sealing of the Holy Spirit differently. I, I just have to go somewhere else with it, you see. Otherwise, I've created a doctrinal conflict in sacred scripture. So, um, yes, we're, we're looking. <laughs> I've got the worst eyeglasses in the world, right? We're looking darkly and dimly into a holy and sacred text. And we are, again, by the Holy Spirit, doing the best we can to weave and knit together uh, those kinds of things. But that's a powerful uh, doctrine of his sealing. And that really is the extent of, the, of, of the, the pictures of sealing and deposit. There, there aren't many passages, of course, that use that directly. But we go to others, like in the Gospels, then, of, you know, um, all the Father has given to me will come to me. Right. And I shall not lose a one of them out of my hand. We'd go to other passages like that. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry. What was that, Ruth? Philippians 
You're right. <coughs> I'm sorry. I'm, <coughs> I got the cough at the end of the night. I lasted till eight. I, I lasted till eight. The Holy Spirit promised me till eight, <laughs> and then I'd lose my voice. So, yeah, Philippians one six. You know, he yeah, he who began a good work. <clears throat> Ruth was sharing that. We'll carry it out to the day of completion. So, friends, we covered three. We covered three of the powerful parts of the doctrine of the Holy Spirit tonight. And thankfully, the parts that we haven't covered, I believe most of them are coming in future chapters that we have already assigned for our reading and for our study. So we, we are going to see uh, more teaching on the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We are, excuse me, we're going to see the filling of the Holy Spirit that's coming in March. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, I think that was combined, March. Um, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, we will be looking at that too. So that because the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, being that he is engaged and involved in everything, of course, that God sent her to do, many of the teachings that we're coming to in the next weeks and months, we're coming right back to uh, seeing what the Holy Spirit does for us. So um, I hope that this was a blessing. Yep, we knew we weren't going to cover everything, but we covered some really important parts of the text tonight. And I pray that that was a blessing for you. So tonight, just as a closing, I did enjoy that Grudem uh, put some unique hymns at the end of each chapter. And if you do have Grudem in front of you, page 653, page 653, the hymn Spirit of God Descend Upon My Heart. I don't remember the tune, but I do remember singing it at certain points. And it is a beautiful closing uh, prayer for us. So I'm going to just read the first and the last stanza of that hymn as a closing prayer. 653, page 653 of Grudem. Spirit of God, descend upon my heart. Wean it from earth through all its pulses move. Stoop to my weakness, mighty as thou art, and make me love thee as I ought to love. Teach me to love thee as thine angels love, one holy passion filling all my frame. The baptism of the heaven-descended dove, my heart an altar, and thy love the flame." Father, thank you for sending the powerful person of the Holy Spirit to regenerate our hearts when we heard the gospel message and were convicted of sin for that first time and believed on Christ alone as Savior. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you dwell within us, that you fill us, and that you empower us to live for Jesus. Oh, we pray for uh, more of your filling. Please speak to us personally, even this night as we're closing. Uh, Holy Spirit, pinpoint any areas of sin or weakness or doubt that are within us, that we, we might confess those things and, and, and seek, seek cleansing in the blood of Jesus and be done with those things. We, we want you to fill all of our mind, our heart, our soul, and our strength, that we would be given fully and totally to the living God. So pinpoint and weed out from us those areas of our flesh that, that we give time and attention to the things of this world which don't matter and which will pass away. And grant that, that we might walk in you, Holy Spirit. We might live in you. That, that you would be the one who's prompting our thinking and our choosing and our, our, our walking. You'd be the one who would prompt the ministry that you want us to accomplish, um, the places you want us to go and the people you want us to, to serve, that you'd arrange divine appointments for us that we never in our, uh, our, our best calendar dates could make, but you can cause us to cross the paths of those that are dear to you and need some word from Holy Scripture, some ministry, uh, some action of love or tenderness or compassion 
And you're the one to do that in us. So thank you for your initial regenerating work. Thank you for your ongoing work as you live and dwell within us. Um, may you be pleased with our meditation tonight. And, and may you continue to lead and guide us, as is promised, into all truth. So we seek your blessing as, as we're headed to our homes from our live class. And for our Zoom friends too, God, may, may the blessing of the Holy Spirit uh, rest on us all. In Christ's holy name we ask. Amen. Amen.